This message is brought to you by Throat Coat Tea. Highly recommend it. Uh, you know, one of the things that I'm going to miss uh, from Gospel Light when we start Hope Baptist is, uh, is the men's quartet. It'll be a while, I think, before we have that uh, set up there. So it has certainly been a blessing to be a part of so many ministries here. And uh, I'd encourage you not to take for granted the benefits that you have. Uh, others have built, as Pastor has reminded us recently, and poured their blood, sweat, and tears into making Gospel Light what it is today. Uh, so don't take for granted and help to build for the next generation. Amen. All right, book of Psalms, chapter 1. We're going to read these verses, all six of them. Uh, and then I want to make just a couple of comments on verses 4, 5, and 6. But we want to spend the bulk of our time in verses 1 through 3 tonight. But before we do any of that, let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day, God. I thank you for your goodness to us. I thank you, Lord, that we are able to gather together on the Lord's Day. Thank you for the praying and the preaching and the uh, singing that's already taken place this morning and for the testimonies and the singing tonight. And I just pray, Lord, that you'd meet with us now, God. Fill me with your Spirit. Put me behind the cross. May the Holy Spirit be our teacher. And may we have a good time in the Word of the Lord tonight and uh, just go away, Father, helped and more equipped to serve you. And I pray you'd meet the need of every heart. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. There we go. All right. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. You see the contrast here between verse 3, talks about a tree with roots that go deep by the water, and the ungodly that are like the chaff. That's just this little light part that blows off of the valuable part of the, of the uh, grain and just blows away. And that's, that's what's going to happen. They have no anchor, they have no roots, and in the end they're just going to dry up and blow away into hell. Verse 5, therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. You know, there are sinners in the congregation of the righteous today. Yeah. In this yeah. church, there's a bunch of saved sinners, but we're still sinners. And there may be some among us who are unsaved sinners. Mm -hmm. And we can't look and see and tell the difference. But let me, let me just make a couple of observations. Number one, if you are tired of the hypocrites in church, so is God. But there will be a time after that judgment. There'll be no hypocrites in church because all of your hypocrisy and mine will be gone. And those who were never saved, they won't be present. But the, the second thing is, you know, if you're unsaved in the midst of a saved congregation, you might be, I don't want to say fooling the rest of us, but, you know, you, you might be passing for one who's saved. But sinners are not going to stand at that judgment. Right. It's vitally important that you understand where you're at with God and don't take for granted that because you are surrounded by believers that you yourself are one. That's and I don't say that to make anybody doubt, but it is an individual thing. Nobody rides somebody else's coattails in heaven. So Amen. the ungodly won't stand in the judgment. All of the wickedness will be dealt with, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. One day we'll all stand together because of the blood of Jesus Christ and that alone, with all of our unrighteousness gone in that congregation. Praise the Lord. Uh, verse 6, For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. You know, Job, verse 23, uh, chapter 23 and verse 10 says, But he knoweth the way that I take. When he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. And that's where Ron Hamilton's famous song, Rejoice in the Lord, comes from that text. You know, if, if you're being persecuted, misunderstood, hindered, troubled, God knows. Keep doing right. Amen. The Lord knoweth the way of the righteous but the way of the ungodly shall perish. All right, let's back up to verse 1. And we want to look at these three verses in detail. Blessed is. That's present tense. Not will be, not was. Our walk with God is always in the present. You know that? Amen. What you did last week, praise the Lord. What God did last week, praise the Lord. But we don't rest upon those laurels and begin to drift. God, what did He tell Moses? He said, I am. That's His name. He is always in the present and while we can look to the past to be strengthened with faith looking to the future, 
Our walk with God is daily, and we need to maintain it Amen. daily and enjoy it daily. Secondly, blessed is the man. This is an individual choice for every man, woman, and child. There's an opportunity to be blessed here, and it has to do with what the man, the woman, or the child does, what they choose. All right? Blessed is the man. Now, before we get to the good stuff in verses 2 and 3, we start by some things that this man does not do. We start with some negatives, some things to reject, and we see a downward progression, just like in Romans chapter 1. You see a downward progression here. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. You think about walking in the counsel of the ungodly. This picture is someone who's moving. They're, they're moving along the road of life. When you get to standing in the way of sinners, now they're stopped. And they've stopped to hang around, and they've stopped to think about things, and they've stopped to partake. And they wind up sitting in the seat of the scornful if this progression continues. So they've gone from walking with bad companions, bad counsel. They've gone to standing around and hanging around. And, and young people, many people have been shot, have been arrested, have had things taken from them, including their purity, not because they had bad intentions, but because they were standing around in the wrong place with the wrong people at the wrong yeah. time. Right. Unfortunately, uh, it's a tragedy when you hear about some young person that was out, you know, at whatever hour of the day with a group of questionable friends and there was a drive-by shooting, wasn't even intended for them. What were they doing? They were standing in the way of sinners. Yeah. And, and that's an extreme example, but unfortunately it's all too common. Uh, there's people that have been persuaded to go to a party. You don't have to drink. Just come with us. We'll have a good time. You don't have to do anything you don't want to do. And some terrible things have happened to young people. Yeah. I'm just saying, don't stand in the way of sinners. And we could, we could generalize it over all kinds of things. But the idea is that walking in the counsel of the ungodly. What is counsel? C-O-U-N-S-E-L. It's advice. It's words. It's thoughts. It's ideas. So as we're walking on the neutral road of life, you might say, look, you have a walk at work. Do you not? We all got to earn a living. Uh, you drive down the freeway, Right? You're going to see billboards. You're going to see some billboards that advocate for unborn life. Praise the Lord. You're going to see some billboards that will direct you to the gospel. You're going to see some billboards that will tempt you to wickedness or, or advocate for abortion. You, you're on this road of life in whatever sphere you are, and in that sphere, it in and of itself is not bad or good. You're just going from east to west or west to east. But you're going to be presented with counsel of all kinds. If you choose to walk in the counsel of the ungodly, what you're doing is you're entertaining those ungodly ideas. Yeah. And ungodly right. ideas come from ungodly people. And may I just remind you, Jesus said this. He said, either make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree corrupt and its fruit corrupt. We are suckers sometimes as Christians because there's a comedian that doesn't curse very much, and there's an entertainer entertainment company that doesn't put too much garbage out, and there's a political commentator that we like even though he curses and swears sometimes. You follow what I'm saying? Th these are not godly people. And, and how much of our time and of our mind are we spending, and, and I'm guilty of this, I have had to dial back because this happens to me every year. During election season, I get interested in politics. The rest of the time, I don't even follow it usually. But I get interested in politics, and this is one of those elections a little more interesting than usual. And so I'm, I'm, you know, kind of looking for political commentary. And some of these people may have keen political insights, but they're ungodly. And the Bible says this in the book of 1 Corinthians. It says, be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. You know, the communications major in a college is it's about broadcasting. It's about speaking. That's where your, your news anchors and your pundits and you know, these people that, that you see on television, that's what, that's what they major in, it's communications. And so evil communications corrupt good manners. Here's the deception. We think, I know that's not good. So because I know it's not good and I just take it in and I eat the meat and spit out the bones, it doesn't affect me. My friends, what no longer shocks us still affects us. And so if we choose to partake in a certain percentage of evil communications, it has a corrupting effects. No exceptions. So it bears us asking, how much counsel of the ungodly am I walking in? 
Good. You say, well, I don't take their advice about those things. I mean, you're walking down the road, you got your little earbuds in. Is that which is coming in your earbuds ungodly? What percentage of it is ungodly? You're walking in the counsel of the ungodly. Right. All right? Now, walking in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standing in the way of sinners. We talked about that. But, but notice this. You can walk in the counsel of the ungodly, or you cannot on a neutral road. By the time you're standing in the way of sinners, what is a way? You know, the uh, slack water road, but slack water way. You know, whatever way. It's a street. It's a place. It's an avenue. It, it, it is a location where things are happening. And so if you're in the way of sinners, what you've done is you've gotten off the neutral road because you're listening to the counsel of the ungodly, and you've turned aside, and now you're in the way of sinners. This is the place where sinners hang out. This is where they do their sinful things. You follow what I'm saying? So there's a downward progression that we, we were walking in the counsel of the ungodly, and now we're standing. We've stopped and we're standing still in the way of sinners. There's, there's, no good, there's no good thing here. There's no neutrality here. We've crossed the line. And notice lastly, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. That's an interesting turn of phrase. Nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. You know, Jesus said that the scribes sit in Moses' seat. The Bible talks about those who occupy the room of the unlearned. Paul talks about that in reference to tongues. Sitting in the seat of the scornful, what does that mean? Does that mean that if Brother David was scornful, he said, hey, come, come and sit down with me right here in my seat. Let's have close personal fellowship together. Let me teach you my ways. It, it could be that. The picture that I got as I considered this passage is, you know, I, it, I've never been to an actual movie set, but according to television, the director has a chair with a big director on the back of his chair. You all seen that? I picture someone sitting in a seat that has scorner on the back of it. And I wonder if there are people that are sitting in the seat of the scornful and don't even admit it to themselves as their downward progression continues. It's a little bit like sitting in the gate of Sodom. Lot sitting in the gate of Sodom. What was a righteous man doing there? That's good. And yet there he was sitting in the very gate of that wicked city. He's sitting in the seat of the scornful. He's gotten so comfortable. His life is so invested that he, he's become numb to all of those evil communications around him, even though they're still vexing his soul. And there he sits in the gate. You know, a scorner has gone beyond sinning. They mock and subvert righteousness. They're some of the most hard-hearted people out there. And sometimes they hide in churches. See, because a scorner's primary, a fool wants to feel good. You read the book of Proverbs. A fool wants to feel good, and a fool layeth open his folly. A scorner wants to look good. They want to be thought of as smart and intelligent and insightful. And some of the most witty, you know, quick-tongued people out there, they have a very biting tongue. It's that scorn and mockery. And the Bible doesn't really have anything good to say about scorn and mockery. And you think about, sometimes the scorner outwardly doesn't appear eaten up with sin like the fool, but he's actively making disciples to lead them away from God and those who are godly. So I think there's three possibilities here that could happen to a person. Number one, they get invited to sit down on the couch with a scorner and they begin to le learn their ways. Number two, perhaps they have become a scorner and don't even realize it or admit it to themselves and they're sitting in that chair that says scorner on the back. Or the third is, they're like Lot. They're, they're sitting in the council of the scornful. They've, they've got a seat at the table with a bunch of wicked people who are mocking righteousness, and they themselves are so compromised they can't stand up to it anymore. That's the downward progression. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. So before we ever get to the blessing, what does this man do? What does this individual do? We find out what they don't do. And that's an important principle. Look, before you can get saved, you need to understand what you need to repent of. You need to understand that sin is the problem and judgment is the consequence. Otherwise, you won't even turn to Jesus as the cure. All right? Verse 2. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law doth he meditate day and night. Think about this. It's his delight. It's not his chore, his duty, his burden, his checklist. It's his delight contrasted with those in verse 1 and the things that they're into. 
And by the way, it's not sports, hunting, classic cars, quilting, yard work, solitaire, some other hobby. It's in the law of God. Yeah. And I say this to those of us who are parents. When we set the goal so low for our kids that we just don't want them to be on drugs or involved in teenage pregnancy or in jail, we're setting that bar so low. We should want them to delight in the law of God. That should be our goal. That should be. And by the way, they're not going to do it, as Pastor Andy said this morning, if we don't. If what they see in us is a Sunday-only Christianity, they're not going to go further than that, most likely. If you don't delight in God, you're probably going to wind up drifting into at least the way of sinners. Notice also, it's the law of God, not the suggestions of God. But I want to think about this, too. His delight is in the law of the Lord. And then notice, in his law doth he meditate day and night. I think I see two things here. Of course, the law and the prophets refers to the Old Testament, with the law being the first five books. And that gives you the history of this world up through the Jews entering the promised land. And the law of God of the Jewish nation is given. And of course, some may say, well, we're not under that law. And, and we're not. Praise the Lord. But consider what Paul said in Romans chapter 7. In verse 22, he said, For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. In verse 25, he said, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. So as a New Testament believer, Paul's talking about the law of God in his heart. What about Romans chapter 2, verses 14 and 15? For when the Gentiles which have not the law, that would be the Jewish law, the law of Moses, do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law, written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. What is he saying? He's saying, look, the Gentiles have an innate knowledge of right and wrong because God put that much of the law in their hearts. And they can either respond to it rightly or they can disobey it. That's our conscience. We all understand that. That's the law of God written in their hearts. How about Galatians chapter 6 and verse 2? Bear ye one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. That's for New Testament believers. Amen. How about 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 31? Whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. What if for a moment we go back to verse 2, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and we replace that phrase with the will of the Lord. That which pleases God. That which is according to His will. That desire to be on the same page as our Creator and Savior. Psalm 40 verse 8 says, I delight to do Thy will, O my God. Yea, Thy law is within my heart. There's a connection between this concept overall of the law of God and the will of God that is beyond the Jewish law. Yes. And I think we should all be invested in that. It's, it's recognizing God's authority in our lives and it's trying to please and glorify Him. That's 100% applicable to you and I, even though we're not under the Old Testament law. Amen. Okay? So we see that His delight is in the law of the Lord. You could think of it as His delight is in the will of the Lord. Now, or the rule of the Lord. Then it says that He meditates in His law day and night. Now that has got to refer to the written Word of God. What are you going to meditate in? You're going to meditate in the Scriptures. So by verse 2, this blessed individual has rejected, cleaned out, gotten rid of, turned away from, said no to, or said, not anymore, to, a whole lot of garbage and a whole lot of sin, a whole lot of bad advice, and cozying up to those who are the enemies of God. Then, this person has delight in pleasing God and spends time multiple times a day, look, it says day and night, in meditating in the Word of God until that Word saturates their mind and heart. And I'm really excited about this. I came across this formula that I got at a Bible conference several years ago. Unfortunately, I didn't write down the preacher's name, but I did write down these notes. And I was reminded of this as I, uh, as I studied this psalm, and I went back and looked these up. Med How do you meditate in God's Word? I want to give you four thoughts here. Number one, you get it in your mind. You address it with your mind. How does that work? You memorize a verse or a passage. It's hard to meditate on something that you can't hold in your mind. All right? So memorize. Pick, pick Psalm 1 if you want. Pick a passage of Scripture, and you memorize that verse or passage. And some of you are good at that. Some of you are not, but it can be done. Um, secondly, you involve your will. You intentionally focus on the passage. You study it from every angle. You turn over the word and the individual words. You chew on them. As, as the preacher that I got this from said, you climb inside the verse. 
Have you ever done that? Have you ever taken a, a verse of scripture? Maybe it's John 3, 16. And you just begin to kind of break it apart in your mind and put it back together and consider it from this way. For God so loved the world. Well, what does that mean? Well, it starts with God. He so loved the world. He loved the world so much, you can read it that way. He so loved the world. In what way did he love the world? You see what I'm saying? You just, you take it apart, you put it back together, you think about it, and you just consider it, and you ruminate on it. <clears throat> Excuse me. Ruminate has the idea of what cows do. They chew the cud, right? <clears throat> when we ruminate and think on something, we're just chewing it on it. We're chewing it over. By the way, how many of you, don't raise your hand. <clears throat> many of you in here have done what I've done. Something happened that was negative in your life. Somebody said something mean to you. You made a mistake at work, whatever. And you just found that in your mind. Moment by moment by moment throughout the day, throughout the week. If it was really troublesome throughout a month, whatever. What were you doing? You were ruminating on that. You were meditating on that unfortunate incident. That mistake you made. That thing that it's a good thing nobody had a camera because you'd have been on YouTube. You know? Don't be that guy who slipped and fell or whatever. And you ruminate it. You have to intentionally, with your will, choose to ruminate in that way on the Word of God. Amen. Thirdly, emotions. Involve your emotions. What does that mean? You personalize the verse. How does it apply to you? You look at verse 1. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. And you consider, am I doing any of that? Where would I be doing that? Where is the counsel of the ungodly in my life? Is there any place that I'm going? Are there any people that I'm hanging around with that are sinners that are enticing me? Is there any way in which perhaps without realizing I'm sitting in the seat of the scorn? You make it personal. You think of it, you read your own name in there. Blessed is the tailor that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. You put yourself in the verse. You get excited about the possibilities of the passage of Scripture working in your own life, you get afraid of getting on the wrong side of a passage. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. You get your emotions invested in it. And lastly, your spirit. You involve your spirit. How do you do that? You praise and pray through the verses. You thank God for the promises you find in a passage. You ask God to make you the things you ought to be in a passage. Turn to Psalm 15. This psalm just moves me every time that I read it. It's a short psalm, <clears throat> and it says this, Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? He that walketh uprightly, and worketh righteousness, and speaketh the truth in his heart. He that backbiteth not with his tongue, nor doeth evil to his neighbor, nor taketh up a reproach against his neighbor, in whose, vile, in whose eyes a vile person is contempt, but he honoreth them that fear the Lord. He that sweareth to his own hurt, and changeth not. He that putteth not out his money to usury, nor taketh reward against the innocent. He that doeth these things shall never be moved. Folks, that's a phenomenal person. And especially the one that gets me is he that sweareth to his own hurt and changeth not. Oh, I'll be there, brother. Oh, something came up. That's, that's high ground. When I read that psalm, I ask God to make me that person. Because sometimes I struggle to be that person. You know what? You make it personal. You, you pray and praise, praise, excuse me, you pray through the verses. You praise through the verses. Um, you sing the verses. Just you alone in your car, sing the psalms. Make up a song to the Lord with the words of the verses you're memorizing. You say, oh, okay, now preacher, you're getting crazy. Look, <clears throat> I'm just saying, how can you interact with the scripture in a way that it's in your mind? Your will is choosing to dwell on it. You're allowing your emotions to invest in it, and you're involving the Spirit of God. You are communing with God Himself about His Word. I'm all for Bible reading, but this is next level. This is next level interaction with the Word of God. And so, look, <clears throat> you don't have to exactly use that formula, but what, what I'm saying is when the Bible says meditating, we're talking about you're going deep. And it's, it's over a period of time that you're really chewing on and interacting with the Word of God. And so... His delight is in the law of the Lord. It's an affection thing. And in his law doth he meditate day and night. What happens when we do that? Verse 3, And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. That's phenomenal. Especially the last part. I mean, as Americans, we, whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. That's great. 
Now, let's, look, let's go through this. A tree planted. You know, acorns can hit the ground and roll, or they can get buried by squirrels. Uh, uh, birds scatter and transport seeds everywhere. And that's kind of how God set up the forest to populate and spread plants and, and trees and things. But when a tree is planted, someone with intelligence and intent took that tree and they put it in a place on purpose. A tree planted by the rivers of water. That takes specific intention. There's an aspect in which we can choose by what we turn away from and what we sink our roots into where we are planted. I mean, it clearly in the context, it's a man who shuns certain things and he chooses other things. And because of that, he's like a tree planted by the rivers of water. His roots are drinking in the word of God. There's another aspect in which God has planted us as his children. You know, a tree can't plant itself, can it? And what I see here is there is a cooperation between God, the author and finisher of our faith, and our own will submitting to his. He's never going to leave or forsake one of his own, Hebrews 13, 5, but there's also a reality that by our choices, we have the opportunity to be closer or further from the river. That's, that's what's going on. You have a person who is choosing to delight in the law of the Lord, and as a result, he's like that tree planted by the rivers of water. Consider, look over at John chapter 15 real quick. This is what God wants. He wants us flourishing, fruitful, green-leafed and tall with deep, strong roots just thriving by that river. We cannot produce the fruit, but we can influence the conditions that do. If you look at verse 1 in John chapter 5. Jesus says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away, and every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth fruit. More fruit. Now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Notice the word. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine, no more can ye except ye abide in me. Here's the thing. The branch doesn't have a choice. Whether it's going to abide or not. It's just there. We actually have a choice whether we're going to abide in Christ or not. All right? Um, I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me he can do nothing. So the negative is if... The negative is we can't do anything without him, and we forget that and we fall on our faces. But the positive is if you abide in Christ, you'll just bring forth fruit, much fruit. It's, it's, it's uh, as sure as the branch on a tree bringing forth apples. All right, look down at verses 7 through 8. If ye abide in me and my what? Words. words abide in you. So how do you abide in Christ? Well, a big part of it is his words abiding in you. That goes back to meditation in Chapter, in verse 2, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. That kind of sounds like whatsoever ye do shall prosper. Herein is my Father glorified that ye bear much fruit. So shall ye be my disciples. What if we said, Lord, would you plant me a little closer to that river? Would you grant me deeper roots in your word as we pursue meditation? Notice also, by the rivers of water, back to Psalm chapter 1. He should be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. You know, where we're from in Idaho, it's high desert. You get out in the country, and if, if you get away from the irrigated land, it's just brown. It's just maybe tan, tan and brown. You might see some sagebrush. And if you see a line of green kind of winding its way, its way across the you know, landscape, that's a river. Because <laughs> that's the only place that things can grow green in a high desert. Planted by the rivers of water. Folks, if, we are, if our roots are in the word of God and we're meditating on it and we're interacting with God about his word and we're abiding in Christ, it doesn't matter what the spiritual condition around us is. Everybody you know might be dried up, but you don't have to be because you're planted by the rivers of water. You know, the reason some of God's children are miserable is because they aren't bearing fruit. They're not participating in souls being saved. They're not seeing God uh, make changes to them internally, to their attitudes and their, and their emotions. They're not seeing God work in their family. They're not seeing answers to prayer. That is a miserable way to be a Christian. But if we can plant ourselves by the river through meditation in the Scripture, folks, we can see God do some amazing things. His leaf also shall not wither. That's an interesting thought. You know, leaves fall off the tree in autumn, but generally they don't wither and fall off. They just drop. And then they wither once they're on the ground. That speaks of health. You know, if you see a tree with withered leaves, one of two things is true. It's got a disease or it's not getting enough water. And, and just that picture of being flourishing 
even in the seasons where fruit bearing perhaps is a little bit reduced, folks, it may be that you can go through the seasons of life bearing fruit, and despite the drought or the heat or the storms, your leaf won't even wither if you're planted by the water. Lastly, whatsoever you do shall prosper. Now look, we don't preach a prosperity gospel. We've already said we're not under the Old Testament law, and we don't have the promises the Jews had. Look, if they were obeying God according to law in their land, they were healthy, wealthy, and wise. They were. We don't have, we're promised all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But I want to draw your attention to a couple of concepts. Number one, we do have promises of spiritual prosperity. In 3 John chapter uh, 1 and verse 2, Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospereth. There's a spiritual prosperity that is absolutely applicable to us, but I want to draw your attention to two other things. Another side of this is that all things being equal, the righteous will prosper more than the sinner. That's right. They will. You know, that's, this is why elections are important, why you should vote. Because in Proverbs 28, 28, the Bible says, When the wicked rise, men hide themselves. But when they perish, the righteous increase. There is a time when the, when the righteous will hide themselves because there's so much wickedness at the top. But in a free society where that's not the case, the righteous do better than the wicked. But even beyond that, if you're constantly delighting in God and His Word, whatever you do is going to be in line with what God wants. And if you're in line with what God wants, He can fully bless it. You're on blessable ground, okay? Listen to, uh, actually, let's turn there. Joshua chapter 1. Joshua chapter 1. We're getting ready to close with this. Joshua judges Ruth. Joshua chapter 1 and verse 8. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. Meditation brings obedience. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Have not I commanded thee, be strong and of a good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. Folks, notice the progression. The book's in his mouth. He's meditating therein day and night. Because of that, he's doing all that is written therein. And after that, his way is prosperous. Why? Because everything he's doing is in line with the book. You can't get a more prosperous spiritually or a, more, uh, a life that is more available to be blessed by the Lord. So let's bring this home to application. I'm going to guess that most of us here on a Sunday night, we're not standing in the way of sinners. I hope not. If, if the Lord's touched your heart about something, then, then deal with it. But if you think about how this psalm applies to your life, you would probably say the greatest risk to you is the continual bombardment of the counsel of the ungodly from all angles. And the greatest need is probably to increase your delight in the law of God. And so the call to action is really to delight and to meditate. You know, those form a virtuous cycle. You might be here tonight, you say, Preacher, I don't know. I mean, I've never, that sounds kind of weird. I've never meditated on the Word of God. Uh, that, that sounds a little bit odd. I mean, it's scriptural. We're not talking about, we're not, clearly we're not talking about, we're talking about with your will, with your intelligence, communing with God about His Word. But you might say, that's a little bit odd. I don't know if I, if I delight to do that. Well, may I say, we are told, Proverbs 23, 19, Hear thou, my son, and be wise, and guide thine heart in the way. You don't have to be led by your desires. You need to lead and shepherd your desires. And what I would say is, if you will prime the pump by trying a little meditation in God's Word, it will increase your delight. And as your in delight in the Word increases, your meditation will increase. It naturally, it's a virtuous cycle. So I want to propose a very practical action that you can take this week. Number one, think about this. Where are you getting the counsel of the ungodly? Chances are it's through entertainment or news or friends. Those are, the, in my opinion, the number one, two, and three places where Christians get the counsel of the ungodly. May I challenge you to choose tonight. I'm going to reduce or eliminate that influence in my life. Uh, you may need to... Uh, Fast from TV or video games or golfing with your buddies for a week or a month. You may say, hey, at 7 p.m., all the entertainment's getting shut off because I'm consuming too much of the ideas, the ungodly. Whatever it is that you need, but how can you turn that dial down? How can you reduce some of that in your life? By the way, to make room for this. Uh, most of us, I'm not even going to say that. 
the average Christian in America is probably watching more things on a screen, whether they're good, evil, whatever, than they are reading the Word of God. And it's easy to veg out on the screen, but I'm just saying, if we can reduce some of that and make time for this. Secondly, set aside a specific amount of time to memorize and meditate in the Word of God. You might want to start small, but I would encourage you to try doing this every day. I guarantee it'll make a difference. There was a time when I was doing this, and I realized as I was uh, reading this passage, I, I've let that fall off. And I'm excited to get back into it because it is a joy. It's amazing what it does for your thinking. Let's read those verses again. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Folks, I'm not preaching health and riches, but I'm telling you, that's available to us. And the condition is to delight and meditate. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, God, for your word. I thank you, Lord. I'm just encouraged. I, I've been so challenged by the preaching of Pastor Andy lately and the call to disciple.